thinking about this question, you've seen some of the interesting things that Joanne has proposed about engaging community and, and engaging others in the way of, of reinforcing musicality and um, enhancing human function through music. How many of you were here at the conference yesterday, Music Cares? Okay, and how many of you were here Thursday? Okay, so good. Because on both of those days, I talked a lot about the clinical work that I do in neurorehabilitation and in music therapy for patients with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And my interest in the, in the field as a clinician has always been how and why music affects people the way it does, and how, especially people who have lost function due to some kind of trauma or neurologic condition. Um, researchers like Dr. Schlock, who you're going to hear, are starting to help us understand where these underlying mechanisms are coming from. But I really, over the years, believe that, that music and the components of music do a lot directly to the brain itself. And, maybe, and, and that's why we see these clinical um, responses that we do. Uh, one of the challenges in music therapy for many, many years is that the approaches in music therapy are quite varied. Uh, a person could be trained in music psychotherapy, a person could be trained as a neurologic music therapist, a person could be trained as a Nordoff Robin music therapist, which means that they're coming to the clinic with a certain approach to using music therapeutically, but each one of those approaches, they affect function positively. So even though it seems that the music and the way they're using music is different, there's still an end result that either improves attention, improves behavior, improves the way um, the person is able to acquire skills. So my question has always been, is it, we know it's the therapeutic relationship, we know there's something about that interaction between two people, but what is it in the music itself? What is it in the structure of music that helps organize or arouse um, certain primary areas of brain function that then transfer over to other types of functions such as motor initiation um, or speech. You know, is it the structure? I remember years ago a neuroscientist told me that, well, the brain is musical because it's nothing but signal and absence of signal. And it's those patterns of signaling, signaling over time that inform function. Well, if music does that, what is it about music? Is, is it the frequencies? Um, is it arousal of certain mechanisms that then entrain or engage other mechanisms, mechanisms in brain function? So it's a very big question. So what is the question that you can answer with a, with a million dollars? Um, what I would like to see is something along the age spectrum of uh, is there a neuroprotective aspect to music? Um, starting from early childhood education, do children who um, engage in, in music lessons and music learning or enriched sensory environments, and like, these studies are being done, but a way to really track them across the continuum, are their brains over time different than people who aren't exposed to those? If so, do those same children over years um, have the kind of neurodegenerative problems such as Alzheimer's disease or memory problems? It, it are, are enriched networks in and of themselves neuroprotective? Now I'm saying this not as a neuroscientist, so if I'm saying anything wrong, I'm not sure, but pie in the sky as a clinician, um, Wondering what is it that, that music can enhance or sound and, and that kind of exposure. One of the things um, in aging studies that have been published just recently is something as simple as active music making in a group similar to your choral singing, but engaging a person in just physically playing music um, helps increase attention and focus. Now, physical activity helps do that as well. So again, what is the music component to this? And can we use uh, the music to help enhance function? In people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, something as simple as increasing attention or engagement in an activity for a, a, a piece of time is, has carryover to the point that they do improve their memory, short-term memory. So early on in the disease process, um, people who have 
diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, if they're engaged in meaningful activities in the beginning of that disease process, do they progress slower than people who aren't engaged in those types of activities? A good example, um, just from popular literature right now, is uh, the musician, oh, my mind just went back. Anyway, he'll come to me. Um, uh, uh, huh, that's amazing. <laughs> I need music therapy right now because my mind just went blank. Um, anyway, a particular singer who just went on the road who um, has Alzheimer's disease, and at the beginning of his tour, he, tell me, Glenn Campbell, thank you. So at the beginning of his tour, he had some new songs written for him by Jimmy Webb for his new album. Um, man's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. He learns these songs. His family s says he has a hard time remembering the words. They have to keep cueing him for the recording. Goes on tour, has teleprompters for the songs. Um, still during his first few concerts, I saw his first one, he needed a teleprompter to remind him of the words. But then during the course of six months being on tour, I saw him again at six months and he was singing all the words to the song not only singing the words to the new songs, but telling his daughter that in the midst of the concert that he really likes this part. So even anticipating the bridge to the song, the song that six months ago he didn't know that well. So the whole idea of engagement, engagement even with somebody with dementia, does active engagement in playing music, now this is a musician of course, so he knows it, but an active engagement in something like a musical activity why and how does it enrich or preserve attention, memory, and activity in real time? And so those would be my questions because clinically we've seen these over the years many, many times with our Alzheimer's disease patients in institutions. And even in those environments where the environment is so strange and anxiety producing, these individuals, if they're engaged in activities consistently, every day do show improvement in attention and behavior. So there has to be something in that just engaging somebody in meaningful activity. And I think music holds attention and, and allows for action that other activities don't allow for. So definitely something about neuroprotectiveness of music from across the age spectrum, from early childhood development to preservation of function or retain, retaining of function at the end of life. The other area, and this is a really selfish one because um, over the years, I've met with many different strategic planners and funders and um, people who, I keep asking, well, what do we need to do to get music therapy more available in neuro rehabilitation? And there's so many wonderful studies out there, so many um, published papers about uh, using rhythm to enhance rehabilitative goals in people with stroke and Parkinson's disease. There's been enough studies to show the efficacy of music in neurologic rehabilitation. What I'm told time and time again is that the only, at least in the States, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in the States, if it's not cost effective and if you can't prove the cost effectiveness of a treatment, then you're less likely to get insurance reimbursement or you're less likely to have an administration pay for a position for that job. So the ideal study I would have would be a multi-site um, study on cost benefit of a specific technique of music therapy, maybe rhythmic auditory stimulation for gait or um, something that would address the type of person who comes into a subacute rehab program to address the needs of both their um, acquiring of the skills that they need. In, in the States, we have something called functional independence measure as the measure at which a person ends their rehabilitation reimbursement and is discharged back into the community. So can they achieve those levels of functional independence quicker if those skills are retrained with music therapy paired with traditional physical and occupational therapies? And if that's the case, how much quicker do they acquire the skills Two days later, I mean two days before, five days before, um, is there an enhancement of that acquisition of skill 
if paired with music therapy? And what's the cost benefit to the insurance companies for that? If we could show that, believe me, you can have all the wonderful studies in the world. If you can show a cost benefit to a, a hospital or a health insurer, they're gonna have lots of those services. Uh, and they don't care if they work in that, because I shouldn't say that, but it's true. If, if, if there's a cost benefit to them to add something to that treatment, they're gonna make sure that that added treatment is there because they're gonna save money, the patients are gonna recover faster. What those underlying mechanisms are and how they work will be important to know, but I don't think they're as crucial as being able to show that this had an impact on this person acquiring functional independence and going back into the community. And so it could have psychological underpinnings, it could have neurological underpinnings. At the end of the day, it's whether that person acquires the function and that they're discharged and the organization saves money. So those would be my two things, a, a lifespan, of course the life spectrum of the impact of music on um, neuroprotective protection, I guess, or neuroplasticity across the age spectrum and a cost benefit study in rehabilitation paired with music therapy. Thank you very much.